Campaign 2018 is sponsored by Wisconsin Hospital Association, Wisconsin Counties Association, Wisconsin Realtors Association, Marshfield Clinic Health System, and Campaign 2018 partner Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Kevin Nicholson of Pewaukee is a Republican candidate for the U.S. Senate. The primary is August 14th. Kevin, welcome to Wisconsin Eye. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. This week's Marquette poll, 34-32, which with a margin of error, a dead heat, 30% undecided. So what's your message in the final 25 days of the primary to the 30% that are undecided, sir? It'll be the same as what you've heard so far, that A, it's going to take an outsider to beat Tammy Baldwin in the general, and it will. I mean, this is the, the very consistent pattern of our state, whether it's Ron Johnson coming from manufacturing in the Senate or Donald Trump coming from well outside politics, winning Wisconsin route to winning the presidency. It takes conservative outsiders to actually activate the Republican base in this state in federal elections and win. So it's going to take that to win this, this election. But more important, and this is what I'm really going to say to the voters on August 14, is that it's going to take an outsider to do things different in Washington. You look who's endorsed me, whether it's Ted Cruz or Mike Lee or John Bolton or the Club for Growth, all these other giants of the conservative movement that are behind us, in addition to 10,000 small donors from all 72 counties in our state, they understand that it takes people from outside the political class to fix the problems of the political class. Nobody in a Republican primary honestly believes somebody reared in the political class is going to go there to Washington and do anything substantively differently than what we see today. The Vukmir campaign says, look, this was our first time to lead this poll. Um, is that... <laughs> Was that significant? I mean, I don't know if that's a lead, but I will say this. They certainly have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars and taken their best shot to remind everybody of what I've been saying to the whole state of Wisconsin, which is, yes, I was once a Democrat. Yes, I was wrong on the matters of life when I was a young person, and I am pro-life today, and I have the endorsements of Wisconsin Right to Life, a 100% rating from uh, Pro-Life Wisconsin, and an endorsement from Wisconsin Action, Family Action Pact, because they know that ultimately I'm the success story they're looking for, that, that I was not raised in a pro-life household, but I became pro-life through experience, through life. I believe life begins at conception, but I had to live life and go out and become a husband and father and see innocent life thrown away in combat before I fully understood the importance and the obligation I have to protect innocent life and children. And so, look, if Leah Bookmeer wants to spend every last dime she has wasted on telling people what I've already told them, she is welcome to, but you can look at the polls if their goal was to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars and end up in a tie so that now we can go and close this primary out, end it, and take on Tammy Baldwin, that was a very failed strategy, but they are welcome to do it. When I first interviewed uh, Ron Johnson before he was, he was a U.S. Senator, he ran a manufacturing company. Yep. You're an outsider. What have you been doing for the last two or three years? <laughs> well, we all know I was in the Marine Corps, and I got out of the Marine Corps in 2009. I went to graduate school for a couple years, and since then I've worked as a management consultant. And look, I, I've said this repeatedly. My job is uh, clients hire us in, they have a problem, we have to solve it. It's a sense of urgency. There is no day on my job where I'm just clocking time. I am there on behalf of a client, like I'll be in Washington on behalf of a voter, actually solving problems. And look, you either deliver, I deliver, or I get fired. And that is the way it should be. And that should be the attitude that people in politics have. You're either in Washington actively solving problems on healthcare, on national defense, on looking to the future to create opportunity and not just simply excessive regula regulation, or you should go home. And nobody should be doing it as a career. That's been my entire professional life. Um, Senator Johnson said, uh, says this is his last two, two terms is enough. Uh, have you adopted a similar position? Yeah, and I've signed a pledge to that effect. I will not serve more than two terms in the U.S. Senate. I believe it's the right thing to do for a lot of reasons, and here's why. It's not just a talking point. It's important that you and your, your viewers understand this. Think about the, the leverage lobbyists have. Why do they have it? They have it because they promise politicians the, the ability to fund their next campaign. Now, we've already raised $3.2 million. It's over double our primary opponent. Our primary opponent who has not released her fundraising numbers yet, which I find very amusing. Look, the bottom line is I've done that <laughs> as not an elected official, not as a multimillionaire. We're out there reaching people. It's 10,000 small donors in all 72 counties of our state that are fueling that. So, look, I haven't needed lobbyists to get to where I am today. I've needed the people to actually step up, which is why we're winning this campaign and why we'll win in November. But, look, limiting myself to two terms takes the leverage away from lobbyists. Because if your goal is not to go there for 40 years, what are they going to hang over your head? 
head. At the end of the day, the people of Wisconsin need to understand this is not my career. And they should also understand I'm very comfortable being a one-term senator. If I go and I deal with our spending problems, I put us on a more sound footing when it comes to security. And if it takes hard decisions to do that and people decide they don't want to send me back, I am totally comfortable with that. I am not desperate to be a U.S. senator. I am determined to win the future of my country. And that should come through in everything I say to people. I don't think either my primary or general election uh, opponent could say the same. Your biggest financial backer is Mr. Eline, uh, who lives in Illinois. Would you be in this race if you didn't have his support? Of course, and we'd be winning. Look, I mean, the bottom line is I mentioned 10,000 small donors in all 72 counties in this state. That is the grassroots of our state buying into our campaign, investing in a big way. Trust me, if anyone else in this primary had anything close to that, you'd hear about it all the time. So, look, we need the buy-in of the people of the state of Wisconsin. The polls have shown whatever. We've been leading in eight of nine of them. That's great. We always knew the race would tighten. And at the end of the day, if they've taken the shots they have and Leah Bookman and her allies have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to misrepresent me, they're, they're free to do it but it's not gonna work. And it's a big part of the reason people can't stand politicians is their willingness to perpetrate lies and manipulate situations. Our focus remains on beating Tammy Baldwin, who in no way, shape or form is doing anything to make this country more secure or more prosperous. Um, lots of news this week. Yep. The president's first statement with Mr. Putin in Helsinki, were you disappointed in that? Look, I wanted to just take a step back on Russia and then look at this in greater context. because I think you. it's important. Since the time of the czars, nobody has been able to trust the Russian leadership, least of all the Russian people. Millions of Russians and Europeans have died under their rule. They, they have manipulated situations within their own country and then international relations as well, too. I find it interesting and amusing that the Democrats and the mainstream media have discovered the red menace about 70 years too late. Welcome to the party, here we are. And so, no, we should continue to not trust the Russians, but I think it is worthwhile to keep an open line of communication with them and to find ways to actually communicate and effectively work together when and where we can. Let's remember, Franklin Roosevelt sat next to Joseph Stalin, who was a mass murderer. He did it because he thought that he needed that alliance to win World War II, and he did. So at the end of the day, American presidents have to deal with all sorts of people that are unsavory and untrustworthy, and they have to do it in a way that benefits the American people and our positioning. I do think an open line of communication is worthwhile. The last thing I'll say on this is I would have appreciated some of this outrage I hear from the media when it came to the Iran deal, a deal that actually did send cash, billions of dollars to a state sponsor of terror that was killing us in both Iraq and Afghanistan. By that I mean literally, and I, my counter IED team found the devices in Afghanistan, Iranian made IED devices planted in the ground and politicians like Tammy Baldwin and Barack Obama were all for sending them and did send them billions of dollars of capital to continue to finance terror, to kill Americans, to kill our allies. That's something to be legitimately outraged over. Or for that matter, professional politicians who thought North Korea having nuclear weapons in perpetuity was just an okay thing and we all had to deal with it. Boy, that came direct from the Obama administration. Tammy Baldwin supported all this nonsense. So yeah, people can have stylistic differences with the president all they want, but I see, I see real traction in Iran, I see real traction in North Korea, two places where the mainstream media thought it was just fine for a terror state to have nuclear weapons, another to be developing them while they actually built the IEDs that killed me, killed my friends and those I served with. And I take that incredibly uh, personally. How serious did Russia try to influence the 2016 presidential election? I think you should assume that Russia has been trying to, to influence every election that they could since Lenin overthrew the czars, right? Like, I, I don't know the details, nor do you. If we did, we could talk about them in greater detail, but let's assume they're always trying to do that, right? Like. <laughs> let's assume that's been part of their game, right? And they've tried to find ways to influence the people of the United States since day one. And so, I, again, I go back to since the time of the czars, we should not be trusting the Russians. But at the end of the day, we have to deal with the Russians. So, yeah, keep an open line of communication. When and where we can work together, we will. But we always have to put the interests of the American people and the American Republic first. The Democrats, some Democrats in Congress are talking about a resolution that would reaffirm support for the intelligence communities and in light of the president's comments in Helsinki. Uh, something you could support? Showmanship and nonsense. It doesn't mean anything. Those same Democrats should have been paying attention to, again, the Iran deal, trying to do something about North Korea, thinking strategically about how we keep our enemies' heads down instead of financing them. And that's what actually prevents wars. At the end of the day, it's the same nonsense thought, talk, talk that you see coming from Tammy Baldwin, it was just someone who has co-sponsored legislation on more than one occasion to put a $10 billion a year Department of Peace into effect. I take a personal affront to that, here's why. We have a Department of Peace. It's staffed by the Marine Corps, the Army, the Navy, 
and uh, the Air Force. And they go out and they risk their lives. And sometimes they die on foreign shores in order to secure real peace and to generate honest prosperity for the future. And so for those of us that are really sacrificed, the idea that Wisconsin's senator is out there co-sponsoring $10 billion a year worth of bureaucrats to basically thumb her nose at those of us that actually do secure the peace is it's garbage, and that's the nicest thing I can say about it. We need to think strategically about how do we stop wars before they start. Tammy Baldwin is not doing anything in, along those lines, and that's how kids end up fighting the same wars that I did. I want to stop that, but you need to do that through strength and, and intelligence. As somebody who serves in those theaters, let me ask you this. Should we withdraw our troops from Afghanistan? We need crystal clarity in mission, and I've always thought this in, in Afghanistan, and I'll, I'll be transparent about this, knowing people that have lost their lives there, both friends and family. Um, what is the objective? What do we truly want to achieve? And so what I think is achievable in Afghanistan is this. This is my personal opinion, having been there and fought there. You can actually create a, a internal security force, regionally based throughout that country, in which people will fight for their clan and for their region and their town. And that's about probably as far as we can get that country. Now, what progress they will choose to make in the future uh, is up to them, and they will have to decide that. They have no desire right now to become a westernized nation. I can tell you this because I have talked to local Afghan villagers about this. Their goal is much in the same goal that you have. They want their families to be safe. They don't want their children to be butchered by Taliban thugs, and that is a real concern that they have. But we can actually help to build an internal security force that can defeat internal security threats. Many of the mistakes I saw the Obama administration make in Afghanistan involved trying to change that into a westernized nation. It was not realistic. Lack of mission, curtailing our rules of engagement such that we actually could not effectively fight to keep ourselves safe and to keep the local nationals safe. And it's very tactical stuff, but mistakes on every single level, all supported by Barack Obama, all supported by Tammy Baldwin, blatantly inappropriate. So drill the mission down into something that's achievable and that's tactical, and this will play, and it's getting a little bit beyond your question, but it's important that you and your viewers understand this. What's my threshold for deployment? Crystal clarity and mission, and an achievable mission. It can be hard, but it has to be achievable. Overwhelming financial and human resources to end the fight quick, because quick fights save lives, both American and local nationals. Then an honest plan about who's gonna stay behind and how long. At least a projection, because we're still in Germany, and we're still in Japan, for good reason but we're still there, we should be honest about that. And then an honest plan to take care of veterans and their families when they come home. People of Wisconsin need to understand that I get every single word I just said. I intrinsically understand what it means. Tammy Baldwin doesn't, neither does my primary opponent, because I've thought about this and I've lived it. And it is important that United States Senators get, it's that kind of thought processes that make sure that we only go into fights when we're ready for them and we're prepared. And then those of us that are in the Senate have to stand up and own that and vote for it and say, yes, I think this fight is worth risking America's sons and daughters, or it's not, and here's why. International trade. Was the president right to call the European Union a foe, his term, of the United States on trade? Look, I think yeah, I want to take a step back and trade, talk about it in general. So you hear a whole lot of people upset about tariffs right now and all the rest of that. That's where I was going next. Right, to, to and let's ahead. talk about that because that's what matters. Because um, Senator Johnson was very critical of tariffs, and he said he'd like to tell that to the president how much it's hurting Wisconsin. Excuse me. Sure. No, I, I appreciate it. And look, the bottom line is this. I, I believe in the value of trade. I believe in the value of free trade. I believe in the value of strategic trade. We don't have any of those things right now. We've got a situation where within the context of NAFTA, um, uh, Wisconsin dairy products leaving our state going to Canada can be subject to a 270% tariff. Likewise, the Canadian government basically owns the Canadian timber industry and can ship subsidized timber into our nation and basically displace Wisconsin's timber, timber industry. In so many ways, they did that. That is within NAFTA. That, that is not free trade, and nobody should, should pretend otherwise. These tariffs that have been put up in China and in India have encouraged the, uh, or excuse me, discouraged the shipments of, of fully produced and assembled products. Why do they do that? They do that so that companies in the United States will have to ship not assembled products and do the assembly work in their country. So in essence, transferring jobs direct from Wisconsin to other places. All these folks in Washington are just okay with that. They say, that's fine, we all have to deal with that, we've signed these deals and that's just the way it is. Tammy Baldwin says, that's just fine. My take is this, let's move to a world without tariffs. I, that should be the objective. I believe fully and wholly that is the president's objective. And what he is saying is, if you're a trade partner of the United States and you want access to the American consumer market, great, come back to the negotiation table, let's get rid of all these tariffs and nonsense, allow trade to occur. 
I talked to Wisconsin farmers all around our state. They're sick of being patronized by politicians and they want access to markets. I mean, it's, it's very simple. That's a business. Farms look beautiful and we all drive by them. Well, look, I worked as a ranch hand. I've seen agriculture from the inside. It's hard work, but it's a business and they need access to markets. Our Wisconsin dairy farmers and crop farmers should be able to sell first freely throughout the United States. And there's, that can be problematic and dairy farmers will tell you that, but they sure as heck should be able to sell to Canada, to Europe, to South America without facing tariffs. And if those countries don't want to play by those rules, we need to pull them back to the negotiation table and say, let's trade, but let's do so honestly and fairly. Um, as a veteran Marine, and your slogan is send in the Marine, help me understand why the NRA just this week endorsed Ms. Uh, Vukmir. I mean, look, I, if we want to get endorsements, I'm endorsed by Ted Cruz and Mike Lee because they're two of the best constitutional conservatives to understand I get what the Second Amendment's really about. I don't make decisions for any of these groups, right? It's not my place to. but. I can tell you, I mean, the idea is this. I mean, yeah, as a Marine, I fought for our constitutional rights, and I understand the Second Amendment really does exist, not for hunting and fishing. To all your viewers, be aware of anyone that's talking about the Second Amendment and brings up hunting or fishing, because they intrinsically don't understand what the amendment is there for in the first place. So I want to point that out. Second, what it's really about is that you, as a citizen of this country, always have an inherent right to protect your life and liberty. And once that is transferred away from you to the government, that is a fundamental transfer in so many ways of the ownership of your life and your liberty. And so our founders understood this and they said, look, at the end of the day, you own this, right? The police exist to, to protect the peace and when and where they can, they will always, and our public servants de deserve to be lauded for doing this, will risk life and limb to save innocent people any which way that they can, but they're not always there. And that's why the Second Amendment exists, that so you always have that right. And look, anyone who's, and again, from uh, Cruz and Lee, again, two of the best advocates for the Second Amendment and, and basically the Constitution that exists in the Senate, wouldn't be with me if they didn't understand that, that I get that. And same too with the grassroots of Wisconsin. So we're gonna win this race regardless and just keep our, our pedal down. The international debate over immigration, what should be the next steps to resolve this controversy? So I think it's fundamentally critical and it's funny you talk to people of every background in our country and they, they really do agree with this unless they are so highly politicized from the left we need to stop illegal immigration we need to do that for a couple reasons one is people should come to this country illegally because it allows them to come here on a fair footing and it allows them to stop others from taking advantage of them so one of my problems is and your viewers should do this google tammy baldwin cnn and immigration and watch what comes up it's a, one of the most ridiculous interviews you've ever seen in your life in which a, a CNN anchor asked a very fair question, which is if you're so upset about what's happening on the border today, why weren't you upset during the Obama administration when the same thing was happening? And what I will point out is this, the hypocrisy of the left and immigration is insane. They have encouraged their politics and policy people to come here illegally. When they get here illegally, they hang in limbo and they're dependent on politicians like Tammy Baldwin uh, to curry political favor with them. And it's not acceptable. What I want is, yeah, build a wall, build an obstacle, do what you have to do to stop people from coming here illegally. Now, then we'll have both the political will and the opportunity to say, let's build a merit-based, economically sustainable uh, immigration program. And it is, this can be done. It's, it's the politicians that are stopping it because they want cheap votes or they want cheap labor. And would, it's just not right. Would the end result of that process be citizenship or legal status, sir? Well, so, I mean, think about it this way. It's a whole reset, right? Like, it should be merit-based. And that doesn't just mean PhDs, by the way. I talk to people in all different industries in our state. You need people that want to work hard. And it can mean working with your hands. It can be, you know, uh, being a physicist. I don't really care, but I do know this. We can toggle those numbers up and down on an annualized basis based on our unemployment rates and the type of skill sets we're trying to bring to our country. So we can do this logically. But it should be merit-based. And then as you come here, yes, you come here in a legal status, and then you'll have an opportunity to pursue citizenship, which is the way it exists right now, right? But that should be far more clean. You come here legally, then there's a process. And then as you start that process of citizenship, and I fundamentally believe this in my heart, that you have to understand, go through an education process that says, you're asking to become a citizen in the world's greatest republic. Now here's what that means. You get the Bill of Rights, the most amazing thing that would, that in so many ways uh, we've ever written down, uh, and it's inspired by God to be sure, but it's such a great creation that we've, that, we've, that we've put forward in this country. If you want to be part of that, it's counterbalanced by responsibilities. Everything in a republic works that way. Both your rights and your responsibilities counterbalance each other. There has to be an education process that you go through in order to eventually achieve citizenship if you want to do that in the first place. 
everybody, and I can tell you, talking to the people of Wisconsin, they love immigrants. They hate illegal immigration. And those are two very different things. So to create the will to create that kind of system, mm -hmm. stop illegal immigration, get rid of politicians like Tammy Baldwin that are trying to encourage it. Let's move to the next step and do this with like an open heart, knowing that we've stopped the, the illegal immigration problem. Now we can put together a sensible legal immigration problem. Your party has been unable to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act. Is that, would that be your focus in the Senate, if, or is it time to move on? If it's time to move on, what's the new strategy on health care, sir? Well, it, so it has to be repealed, and it will be, and I'll tell you part of the reason why, and you're probably familiar with this, the uh, tax reform package removed the tax that was associated with Obamacare. Yeah. Ultimately, uh, the Roberts Court, when they said that Obamacare could stand, which I believe was a heavily flawed opinion, but nonetheless, that was their opinion, uh, it was all predicated on the idea that Obamacare was a tax. Now, those in the legislature that passed it lied and said, no, it's not a tax, it's not a tax. That was Nancy Pelosi saying that. Uh, Tammy Baldwin right there with her. But at the end of the day, um, it was a tax. And uh, the tax reform uh, legislation removed that tax. There is no legal standing for that law anymore. We're going to move beyond Obamacare. The question is, how do we do this intelligently? I'll tell you, one of the first steps we have to do is introduce price transparency, real consumer choice. Yes, that means choice across state lines for insurance providers and such. And we need to incentivize Americans to save in health care savings accounts. Now, that trifecta, choice, price transparency, and allowing people to spend their own money intelligently on in health care will drive down the cost of health care. It is the only way we're going to do this equitably while protecting uh, the quality of health care in our country. And here's why. What we have now in Obamacare exacerbated every single problem that was already in existence in American healthcare is a system where everybody wants good health, as they should. No one knows what it costs, and someone else is usually paying for it, whether it's an insurance company, an employer, or the government. That is perfectly designed to explode aggregate spending, and if you look at all of our projections, it's going to, both in the private sector and the public sector. It's where companies struggle because they can't even figure out what the cost curve on this whole thing is, neither can the government. But by introducing real and rational consumer choice into healthcare with price transparency, we will drive down the costs. And boy, by the way, Medicare and Medicaid will benefit from that because they can't set prices. They're not good at it. Just like any collectivized, centralized planning institution, they're really, really bad at deciding supply and demand. So the more the market sets the price, the more Medicare and Medicaid benefit from those lower prices. Likewise to the VA, you know, Tammy Baldwin, She's having rallies in Wisconsin with Bernie Sanders for socialized medicine. It's going to be a very clean debate come, come October, November, well, September, October, November, mm -hmm. between me and her, where it's like, hey, she believes in socialized medicine. It's a failure, but she's allowed to advocate for that. Here's what we can really do to protect the quality of health care. And I'll remind everyone in this state that the VA is a single-payer, government-run health care system, and it doesn't work very well. There's good people in the VA, but the VA doesn't work very well. And ultimately, when Tammy Baldwin saw people that desperately needed her help at the Toma VA, she turned a blind eye to them. And when literally a veteran died and others saw their health imperiled in a single-payer government-run health care system, Tammy Baldwin, our U.S. Senator, did nothing for them. And that's not acceptable. You won't get a chance to vote on the confirmation of, of justice, uh, potential Justice Kavanaugh. But if he's confirmed, do you hope that the Supreme Court overturns Roe versus Wade? So, look, let me, here again, I want to give you the full context on this. I believe the Constitution is a pro-life document. I believe that it says, and it, it, it literally does say this, that our rights are given to us by God, and that no government can interfere with that. Now, at no point does the Constitution say that it happens at a certain week or a certain stage of, uh, of your growth. It, it, your rights are given to you by God. I believe that life begins at conception. I will support judges and justices who also view the Constitution as a pro-life document. And then I expect that that will that will flow through all their decisions. And so, in so many ways, we want to, again, imbue the individual with the fact that their rights matter. And that's what, frankly, creates all the prosperity you see in our country. So, look, I fully, and again, you can't dictate uh, or even like sit down and question justices and say, well, how will you decide in this specific case? But I do have a full expectation that they view uh, our Constitution as a pro life document. I expect that they will then decide accordingly. The debate over climate change, how severe a threat do you think it is to the world's environment, sir? So I've talked to many physicists about this. No one knows exactly what the, I mean, let's start <laughs> here again with full context. No one knows why we had ice ages, right? The place that you and I are standing right now might have been underneath a mile of ice uh, in a number of thousands of years ago, right? Yes. No one can fully articulate why that is. So here's the bottom line. Pollution in the air is a bad thing. What exactly that pollution constitutes, um, whether it's uh, 
uh, carbon or whether it's lead or whatever the case is, we want to extract pollution from the air as best we can. Technology in many ways is moving quickly and allows us to keep as much, much pollution out of the air as possible. Now, politicians like Tammy Baldwin and Barack Obama making whatever kind of conclusion that they want and then saying that they understand physics better than physicists and this is exactly what's going to happen if we keep doing X, Y, and Z in our economic development, that's just nonsense. They don't have the first clue about what they're talking about. I know enough through my life and my education, my business experience, and my combat experience to know what I don't know. I will say this, it's great for us as a federal government to invest in our national labs that can invest in research and technology. That's, that's intelligent. What's stupid is people like Barack Obama and Tammy Baldwin in favor of shipping money to Solyndra and various failed um, uh, alternative energy companies that are quote unquote in the private sector that actually in so many ways freezes innovation, right? Because Solyndra might have a bad product, like for example, a solar panel that will never collect as much energy over its lifetime as it took to produce it in the first place. That really happens. And we might, Barack Obama might say, I want to shove money at this thing because I think it's really cool. It makes me look cool when I do it. It doesn't actually help the market advance. It doesn't help, the, it freezes innovation because now Solyndra is just going to keep producing their garbage product forever. What I want to see is when we invest as the people, we do it intelligently. And there is a public good in putting money into research labs that can help develop technology. And if you want to talk alternative energy long term, the best investment we can probably make is in the ability to store the power of the sun, not just collect it, but store it. Are we there yet? No. But research and technology and pushing forward will help us get there. And in the meantime, cheap and plentiful energy is one of the most important things for encouraging prosperity the world over. And actually, and I'll tie this all together, stopping armed conflict. Because it turns out when people have opportunity to go out and live their life, to go out and go forward and be successful, that they're less likely to start wars. This is all tied together. But I don't see enough people in Congress thinking about it. And every time I hear a goofball career politician professional saying that they understand the physics of climate science when they're clearly just making it up, I get sick because they want to limit economic opportunity and make energy more expensive in an attempt to achieve their political objective, which at the end of the day is just getting more donations from people that they think will do so because they agree with them on uh, whatever the, the, the rule of the day is on climate science. Let's think intelligently, let's invest intelligently, let's pursue wherever we can find it, cheap energy, because it's good for all of us. Um, time's getting away from us, so sure. just, cu ju just a couple more questions. The latest estimate is that Social, Social Security will be technically bankrupt by 2034. How would you fix it? So our, our twin problems as you look forward in our budget, and I've already talked about health care, yes. they're tied together. I mean, it's, it's Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid that will eventually overextend the We have the a 21 federal. trillion deficit. Yeah, well, but it's so much more than that. I mean, if we're really honest, we always say 21 trillion. If you were to accurately size or try to size our health care obligations, it's... It, totally reasonable to think that we have near a $100 trillion uh, deficit, but no one understands that That's number. That's equal to the GDP, isn't it? Well, it's well beyond that. Well beyond well, I mean, it's so many ex exponentially larger than our GDP. So okay, thank you. So that is a, that is a huge problem. Um, but we have to be, so I really honestly, I don't, I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but we have to introduce market forces to healthcare because it's a big part of this. And it's in concert with Social Security. Now, what can we do in Social Security? Look, I think we have to incentivize young people to as many ways as possible uh, to save and define contribution plans to make sure that they're planning for their future because so many people that are a ways off from retirement have no real expectation that Social Security is going to be there in the first place. Then, yes, if you're on Social Security today, no change. No change at all. And so for all the attack ads that are coming from the Democrats, no change if you are currently receiving Social Security or, for that matter, very close to retirement. For the rest of it, let's, let's talk about the potential for means testing and what does means testing look like. It could mean that if you are above a certain income threshold, that you get back literally what you paid into Social Security without the multiplier that comes with it. That seems pretty reasonable, and most people that are in those upper income thresholds are probably okay with that. And then, yes, for those of us that are younger, not yet on Social Security, not yet close to retirement, we should look at indexing uh, the retirement and qualification age to average lifespan. And again, let's remember, Franklin Roosevelt, when he put this program in, it kicked in uh, after the average uh, lifespan of an American. It was meant to be an anti-poverty -po program for those that lived beyond average life expectancy when it was first incepted. So there are answers here that we can do, but it is also tied together with, uh, with Medicare and Medicaid. And to those grandparents out here that are listening to me, you're gonna get lied to by Tammy Baldwin about this. And she's gonna tell you that I'm out to take away Social Security, and I'm not. I'm there to save this country for your grandchildren. So think about your grandson, your granddaughter, where are they going to be in 50 years? What can we do intelligently 
to actually put this country on better footing. Tammy Baldwin is not going to do that for your grandkids. She's going to lie to you today in order to imperil their future, and we can't tolerate that. Two final questions. Number one, last week the, the President's Council on Economic Advisors says the, said this, quote, the U.S. war on poverty is largely over and a success. This would justify more work requirements for people on, like, Medicaid. Do you agree with the statement that the war on poverty is over and a, at a, and a success? I don't know about that quote, but let me tell you what I believe when it comes to work requirements and social welfare payments, because I think that's really what you want to know. Um, it's this, and it's that if you are of able body and of able mind, and I really want to make that clear, of able money, body and able mind, then whatever social welfare benefit you receive should be time bound and should be tied to both work training and also to, to actual work itself when possible. I also believe it should be tied to drug testing. Here's why. Let's ins and plenty of people in the private sector require drug testing. Let's disincentivize people from making the wrong choice that can prevent them to getting to the next uh, step of life, because that should be the goal. The goal of social welfare benefit payments for those that are of able body and able mind should be to help them recoup and then move to the next stage of life and become actually successful and then start to accrue wealth for their future and for their family. That is the goal of this. We have to keep that in mind the whole time. So tying this to work and work training for the able body and, and able-minded, that is the right thing to do and it helps them ultimately to, to be successful in life and that's what I want to see. The final question, I want to give you a chance to respond to, yep. to today's Associated Press story. I'm just going to read the first sentence. Companies that Republican U.S. Senate candidate Kevin Nicholson worked for as a consultant laid off nearly 1,900 people since 2015, shutting down plants in Wisconsin and across the country as they moved to save money and shift production overseas. This uh, paragraph mentions you, your response? Truly a shameful, shameful exercise by the AP to just carry the water of the Democrat Party. The reporter that wrote that, I personally reached out to him and told him that I'm just disgusted with his unprofessionalism. We made it perfectly clear, and I'll make it perfectly clear today, my firm doesn't do that kind of work. We actually help to evaluate and build leadership teams, C-level people that we make decisions, uh, help uh, investors decide do they have the right CEO, basically. If you want a better boss, we're the firm that helps you get a better boss. All the uh, nonsense laid out by the AP, just a pure lie and a pure attack, and it really is disgusting. And honestly, look, I know that the media feels very defensive right now because so many people are looking at the media saying, fake news and all the rest of it, but it's stuff like this that you look at it and it's just so abjectly dishonest. It's like literally blaming the Brewers for a Packers loss. It doesn't make any sense. There's no connection between these two things and the AP knew that and they still went to print. And it's that kind of stuff that leaves us conservatives looking at this nonsense and seeing there is a direct line from the Democrat party into the brain of the AP and they simply write what they're told to write without any kind of objective lens because the AP knew darn well before they put it in the print, my firm doesn't do that kind of work and we never have. And so I find it abjectly dishonest, I find it disreputable, I find it disgusting, it lowers my faith in the AP as an institution wide. And honestly, it's important that people of Wisconsin know, yeah, my job's hard, I have to make hard decisions, I have to work hard for my clients, I have to respond or I get fired. That's the kind of attitude that I will bring to the United States Senate, but the attack is nothing more than nonsense. Thank you. Kevin Nicholson of Pewaukee is a Republican candidate for the U.S. Senate. The primary is August 14th, the general election November 6th. Kevin, thank you for talking to Wisconsin Eye. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Take care. Campaign 2018 is sponsored by Wisconsin Hospital Association. Wisconsin Counties Association, Wisconsin Realtors Association, Marshfield Clinic Health System, and Campaign 2018 partner Milwaukee Journal Sentinel.